On this edition of Independent Sources, the Gypsy Mystique, a new generation of Roma is trying to dispel the stereotypes of their culture, being one of musicians, thieves and fortune tellers. Atheists in America, what's prompting more African Americans to proclaim themselves as non-believers? And Remembering the Dead, two artists mark the celebrated holiday El Dia de los Muertos in Brooklyn. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Diana Ravinka. Many Eastern European grandmothers have told their naughty grandchildren that if they're bad, the gypsies will come and take them away. That's just one of the common stories that have made this group of people a sort of boogeyman in popular culture. Gypsies, or Roma as they're officially called, live in large numbers in Eastern Europe but trace their roots to the Indian subcontinent. Many of them have immigrated to the U.S. and even here continue to deal with the negative stereotypes associated with their culture. Tonight I'll speak with Judd Nirenberg of the American Council for Romani Equality and filmmaker George Eli about how the Roma community is coping here in the United States. Thank you both for being in studio with us today. Before we start, I'd like you both to watch this clip. We went uh, to the street and asked New Yorkers what gypsies are. Gypsies are like nomads who sell things? What are gypsies? I can't answer that question. Ladies of the night? Like, you know. Gypsies are people that relocate quite frequently, from what I understand. Any gypsies in New York? Yes. We do have gypsies here in New York. Have you met one? I've not met one. I've never seen one, so I don't know. People come from a from the uh, part of Europe that I know nothing about, really. Um, I guess it's an ethnic race. What are gypsies? Oh, I watch that show. <laughs> I really do. Um, they're a group of people originating in India, a nomadic group of people, um, and they were persecuted a lot in, the, in their host countries. Well, we've heard a few stereotypes. Uh, Judd, what are gypsies? I could give two answers. I'd start by saying who, who are Roma um, and then go back to the question who or what are gypsies. Uh, Roma are uh, an ethnic group with uh, a lot of subdivisions. Uh, Roma have their own language and their own, I would prefer to say cultures and not culture because there really are a lot of sub-communities among the Roma. Roma are today the largest ethnic minority group in the European Union but also uh, meeting in, in Europe as a, as a whole, including the non-members. And uh, Roma are a group of people who, uh, in many European countries, are suffering from a wide range of, uh, of discrimination issues. Uh, what are gypsies? Well, the word gypsy has a lot of, of connotations, uh, some positive and some negative, but, but all of them are stereotypes. And I think that's why many Roma in Europe and a few uh, in the US today would prefer not to, to use the, the word gypsy. And, and just to be clear about being an ethnic group and, and not some age-old set of assumptions. George, is the word gypsy offensive to you? Mm, it's starting to be. It's something we have to, I believe, in my opinion, we have to live with right now um, because so many people, like your clip just shown, doesn't know what a gypsy is. And I'm surprised you didn't take it to, uh, to Broadway because there's gypsies, they say they're, the actors are, are gypsies because the word gypsy carries a more lifestyle rather than ethnic group. What we are is Roma, and like Judge said, it carries everything any race does except the land right now. You know, it's, we share a language, we share a DNA, and we share a culture. That's pretty much universal. There are, depending on where, where in the world you are, it might, the culture might change a bit depending on the territory, but we are very much uh, a, a group, an ethnic group, a race, w just without a land right now. That's so, but the word gypsy was, was named by us. We were named gypsies. We are Roma. Judd, I, I'd like, since you worked in Europe, can you tell us uh, whether or not uh, the Roma people are one of the most discriminated against uh, minorities in, in that region? Uh, I would say so, and, and also uh, most uh, European 
uh, pan European organizations would would say so, and and um, Roma today in in uh, the post communist European countries suffer from uh, in many of the countries a segregated uh, educational system. Uh, in most cases, uh, discriminatory uh, housing practices, uh, discrimination on the labor market, and in the last few years, an increase in uh, racially motivated violence, sort of across the board. Um, Roma are in many of the Eastern European countries the, the largest, if not really the only uh, visible ethnic minority, the only ethnic group that you can sort of spot from across the street and know what their background is. We have another clip that uh, I'd like you both to watch, and it features a young woman uh, who grew up in Eastern Europe and for 20 years uh, hid her ethnic identity until coming to the United States where she was able to uh, acknowledge it uh, and, and, and embrace it. I found a way to keep that part of myself, um, keep being a gypsy away from who I was, I always wanted to belong and be like the others and and be you know have friends and 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 um, and do things together and I managed doing that, but with a very high cost, denying a very important part of of who I who I was. I really did not have um, gypsy friends. <laughs> My dad never came around school. My mom has uh, white skin, so was easier to hide my ethnicity. The biggest problem in my family was shame, was the shame associated with our ethnicity. You know, my grandfather used to tell me all the time, have you ever seen a gypsy who is a teacher or a priest or, you know, all these things that shows that you're part of society. He was happy with his life, he was doing a great job, he did a great job with, you know, being a blacksmith, but he always, you know, wonder what it's like to be a priest or so. So, so my, uh, my uh, the problem uh, with my family was of a status and shame um, rather than um, other, other things. And um, so, yeah, my, my family tried the best to, their best to dissociate themselves from the stereotypes and the stereotypical way of you know, living a, uh, a gypsy life. Gypsy is a very powerful word. It is not offensive to me, uh, but that's because um, I went through a, a long journey of reclaiming the word and giving a word another, um, uh, another meaning. And for me, it is an empowering word. Um, I, I like to use it. I really don't have any problem with it. But it was a long journey to get here. I, I really found the, the, the beauty in it. And as I said, it's, it's, very in, it's very empowering. It makes me want to um, respect society, at the same time refuse absurd conventions. It makes me um, want to do my job and do my, uh, uh, you know, research and uh, uh, be a, a good student and at the same time express uh, myself in a more artistic way. And, um, you know, I love gypsy music. I love ballet. I do ballet. I love combining both of them. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's, it's just beautiful, it's charming, it's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, I really, really um, love it. This young lady is in the United States and she's very excited about uh, uh, accepting her uh, ethnic identity. What do you tell her what she should expect here as a, a Roma girl living in the United States? Well, she's very pretty, so she'll be accepted right away <laughs> uh, in the community. No, um, to expect uh, we're, we're, you know, we're Roma first and American second. Just like a lot of the uh, ethnic groups that came to America, they keep that, we're, we're very rich in culture and we, and we like to keep that. But, um, like, I, I was thought, I thought it was interesting what she said of how there was a lot of shame comes with the culture and she didn't want to say she's a Romney or Gypsy as she put it. The, the problem that a lot of American Rom have is the inner oppression. They also feel ashamed to outsiders of who they are, so they often 
hide themselves. In the United States, it's easier to say, you know, I'm Greek or Italian or Indian or whatever, and, and most Roma here in America and in New York do that because of the stigma that carries the name with Gypsy or Roma. If you tell somebody, Vianora, you're, you're a Roma in New York, they won't understand. They won't, they'll think you're Romanian or from Rome. It just won't get you nowhere. So you have to say Gypsy if you, if you really want to communicate to someone what you are. You had a similar uh, path, a uh, journey to understand your ethnic identity, and you made a, a film about it, Searching for the Fourth Nail. Can you tell us more about working on this film and the personal journey that you had? Of course. Um, growing up in the New York area as a Rom, a Charo, which means young gypsy boy, it's great. You know, you, 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 you're very nomadic. You, you don't have to go to school. It's a, the jobs are very apprenticeship and you're very family oriented and this is a wonderful way to live because there's always somebody around there's always support we love each other and we support each other but then when my children were born um, I wanted opportunities for them and, and, and I know being a home it's difficult so this is when I picked up my camera and start finding out you know why do we do the things we do why do we carry the stigma and that's where the film was born searching for the fourth now and um, it, it showed me that where w that we do come we did have a land we came from India and we wound up in Europe 800 years ago and flourished there some people say that there was 500 years of slavery a lot of people say that's not true but when you do the research there is there was evidence of slavery amongst my people a big focus in your film is uh, uh, the idea of, of schooling in your community and how traditionally uh, Roma kids don't go to school. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to school yourself, mm -hmm. but at the end of the the film, not to, to spoil too much of it, <laughs> um, uh, tell us more about that and how it impacted the way you raise your children. Well, when I started doing the, the, the research of why I didn't go to school, you know, a lot of my family told me, Vianora, that it's not to mix with outside the culture, so you don't fall in love, so you don't... And then through research, I found out that in Eastern Europe, Europe, it was um, it was illegal to educate a Roma child. It was not it's something you didn't do. They were in the peasantry work, so they did not need it. So because we didn't read and write, this oppression led into tradition, which affected me. So now I had to uh, ask myself, okay, this was oppression. This wasn't tradition. Do I pass this oppression on to my children? And the answer was no, of course not, because we are in the United States, which I feel is the greatest country in the world, and it's a big melting pot. We can, and, and Judd, Judd was educated, and he's a very smart person, and, and he, he embraces both things, and that's what my sons will do. Unfortunately, I didn't go through out school all through. I educated myself, but my sons did. And um, I, I, I refuse to believe that an oppressive law should become tradition. Judd, briefly, if you could tell us the issues, the, the biggest issues that the community here is facing. Is there discrimination? I, I've read articles in which uh, uh, the, the Roma people were saying that there's a, a sort of uh, discrimination coming from law enforcement. Absolutely. In some, in some states, uh, there's more evidence of it than in others, but uh, Roma often find that when they interact with law enforcement or with the court system, all a, a lawyer has to do is say these people are gypsies and that's taken as evidence of, of some kind of criminal intent. Anecdotally, it does not seem that, that Roma get, get treated the same as everyone else in, in the legal system here. The other issues that the small number of Roman Americans who are activists raise is that when they expect to see information about their own culture or history, they don't see it. Um, Roma were victims of the Holocaust when we go to a Holocaust museum or a Holocaust exhibit, Roma are, are generally not mentioned or barely mentioned. The whole, the whole history of a people has been reduced to a couple uh, outsiders' images. And um, for Romani Americans who want their kids to understand where they come from, that can be very frustrating. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap the discussion here. It's a very rich conversation, and I really thank you both for, for coming in studio and, and talking with us. And uh, we will make sure to explore this in, in future episodes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Copies of Eli's film can be purchased on Amazon.com or on the film's official website, searchingforthefourthnail.com. Still to come on the show, why not believing in God doesn't mean not doing good. Before that, Marlene Peralta has some other news. Thanks, Vianora.
Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. The Amsterdam News reports on the so-called forgotten neighborhoods of Coney Island, Red Hook, and Far Rockaway in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. The paper notes that although the more affluent affected neighborhoods of Breezy Point, parts of Staten Island, and the Jersey Shore were highly publicized and received assistance, it took days, a lot of media attention, and residents' hard work for poor neglected areas to get help. Polish-American immigration lawyers are advising undocumented immigrants to wait for immigration reform as they see a bigger chance of it being passed during President Obama's second term. One Southampton lawyer, Isabella Kropivnitska, says the president will be more inclined to fulfill his promises in his second term because there is less pressure on him. News India Times reports on the community's failure to get an Indian American from the tri-state area elected to Congress, despite the community's significant population in the area. The report says that it will take a combination of a district favoring the candidate's political party, as well as experience and local participation to get a representative at a national level. Questions are being raised about the leadership of Latino elected officials in Queens. Queens Latino reports that many in the community are unsatisfied and complain that their officials can't bring people together. The publication says Latino residents in Queens are demanding solutions to problems like affordable housing and a school overcrowding. Some experts say the problem with the Latino leadership in the borough lies in the fact that politicians see their jobs as a career, not a public service, and often get elected without support from local community organizations. And finally, a story about a bit of good coming from something bad. Day laborers from Queens and Long Island who haven't worked in weeks are getting jobs thanks to Superstorm Sandy. El Diario La Prensa reports that the cleanup in the hurricane's aftermath is requiring up to 50 men per day to work in Queens and Long Island. Some of the day laborers interviewed are happy for the job opportunities, saying they are getting paid up to $60 an hour to cut trees and clean flooded areas like basements. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Thanks, Marlene. Atheism among African Americans is on the rise, so much so that there are several organizations sprouting up to help these non-believers feel a sense of community. Non-belief in the African American community is a particularly intriguing phenomenon because a Pew Forum survey found that nearly 88% of blacks believe in God. Abby Ishola spoke to Mendisa Thomas and Ayanna Watson, two women who run atheist organizations in Atlanta and New York respectively. They spoke about the difficulty of being a black non-believer and how they are trying to have a positive impact on their communities. Ayana, um, can you describe your journey to becoming an atheist? Uh, sure. Um, let's see. I wasn't raised in a religious family. Uh, my parents were very big on education, so my first real exposure to Christianity wasn't until I was about nine years old when I went to Bible camp. Um, I was very far behind a lot of the other children because they had been uh, going to uh, Sunday school and church regularly and I was you know kind of just coming into it so I studied really hard became you know got my little certificate to be a Christian and um, from there I was more or less I guess I didn't identify myself as a Christian until high school um, at that point I became a deist so I believed in some in something out there but I didn't believe in the Bible or anything like that um, and then fast forward to college I took philosophy and um, that was it. I, I basically put all my beliefs on the table and I determined that there wasn't enough evidence to support uh, at least a God or yeah, any of the gods that I've, I've learned about. Okay. And Mendisa, hello. Yes, how are you? I'm great. And the question I have for you first is, um, you know, black people are typically seen as very religious and very much into God. How does that play a role into the surge in the number of black atheists that are coming out? Well, like Ayana's uh, experience is that more now are becoming uh, more determined and they're, they're starting to now become more courageous in expressing that they've had questions about these beliefs uh, for a very long time or they've come across information that 
they found contradicts what they are contradicted what they believed and um and unfort and that the whole tradition of blacks believing is just not standing much anymore is that why why should we just have to believe just because it's been a tradition okay and you are the leader of um black non-believers in atlanta how many yes. members do you have and what kind of outreach do you do in the community there well, right now we are still building. We're about two years old now, and um, we have online about almost 500 members. We have about a good uh, 15 to 20 uh, people that attend our events in person. The type of outreach that we offer at this time is support for other non-believers in the community. We help over. We help them overcome any religious beliefs, or and and also help to. Uh, deal with any questions that they've had. And in the future, we are looking to uh, reach out more into and work with um, more community organizers as far as helping people financially, um, help uh, health-wise, and uh, physical and mental health. Ayana, you recently started an organization. What right. what has gone into that? Well, I started Black Atheists of America in 2010, and I hope to improve education in the black community through my organization. We have uh, currently one program right now, it's called Science Cube, where we donate uh, supplies to schools in uh, low-income areas or underserved areas. And we're working um, right now on developing or creating, I guess, a uh, after-school program for low-income children as well, so that um, A's we can um, focus on improving critical thinking skills, and then as a typical after-school program, we can help them with their homework, Wonderful. stuff like that. How do people usually react to, to you when you say you're not a believer of God? It depends on the individual. Um, if they're an atheist, it's wonderful <laughs> for them, uh, or for both of us, I guess, but uh, it's shocking. Uh, to say the least. Uh, if it's a believer, uh, it's still shocking, but it's, you know, what happened? Uh, why do you hate God? Uh, it, it had to be some, like, horrific event to get me there, which is, it's, it's completely the contrary. It was, it's education, reading the Bible, uh, cover to cover, not just the parts that people like to refer you to, um, and really uh, studying religion beyond Christianity. Christianity has such a, a strong hold on uh, the black community that uh, it's hard for people to to question it. It's, it's, it's involved in so many different areas of our, um, I guess, of, of, of our social events. I mean, you're going to, I went to a, um, an event recently for black entrepreneur women, and I mean, every other word was God, 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 and very little on uh, the actual uh, service or product that they were offering. But, you know, I mean, that's the nature of the black community. Do you feel that that sentiment ever hinders your work as an atheist? Uh, does it hinder my, I, I, to a, a certain extent, I mean, it, um, within the, within uh, Black Atheists of America, not so much, uh, within my personal life uh, as an attorney, it could, um, but uh, it, it just depends, I guess. What about you, Mandisa? I agree that it, it does depend on the individual. I find that when I uh, when I say that I am atheist or with, with believers, for example, they may have certain questions about what we do believe in, um, how long have you been an atheist, um, what was the catalyst, uh, and and similar questions to what Ayana said. They, they think they may, we may be angry or uh, with, with, with God and such. So I, I tend to, again, I agree that it is subjective or it, it just depends. Okay, so and what do you believe in? What is a black atheist or what is an atheist? An, an atheist is just an, an individual who does not subscribe to belief in any gods, deities, supernatural or supernatural beings. That is the basic definition of an atheist. So what are the misconceptions, would you say, are of atheists? Um, we're devil worshippers. That's a favorite. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see. We eat I, babies. Yeah, we eat babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard we that a couple no of times. We have no morals whatsoever. That's, wow. Yeah, that's a common one. Uh, as far as, you know, your so-called moral barometer as was right. coined by uh, the wonderful Steve Harvey. Um, wow. <laughs> 
Let's see. I, that that's the biggest one, actually, the moral barometer. Like, how do you, how do you, you know, you can just do whatever you want. And I'm like, no, I don't want to, you know, go out and, and cause harm to people. It's it's not because it was never because of believing in any god. Even when I was a believer, it was always because I was raised a certain way and. Um, I, my parents instilled certain values uh, in me, so it was never because of some supreme being. That's also, um, in my opinion, I find it offensive uh, that people believe that you know you have to have a, a higher being to uh, not want to, to cause to be harm. Good. Right. Right. So uh, I think I don't. I don't know. Do you have any other ones? Um, not as far as the misconceptions about us, but um, I would say to answer the question of what we do believe in, uh, we have different, um, we all are outside of not believing in God. We subscribe to different philosophies on life. I tend to um, take stock in other human beings as well as um beings that I'm known to have existed. Uh, many, there are many black heroes and many black, um, many black leaders and, uh, in the community that have done great work. So do, do atheists have a specific code of ethics or is this just a personal thing? No, we don't no. have a code of ethics. We have, um, there's humanism that has a, a code of ethics, which is, yes. uh, most humanists are atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, very few of them are theists, but there are some theists that identify as humanists, which is the idea of putting humans first. So you do whatever you can to, uh, I guess, eliminate poverty and, and things like that, just to make uh, the human race a better rate, overall race. Uh, as far as atheism, that's one of the issues of trying to organize uh, among atheists, because we, our views and values, and they we are, just have, they're, they're so, so they're, diverse. They're so vast and right. wide, and yeah, that can be kind of, that can be taxing and challenging. Right. <laughs> wow. Well, we have to end the conversation there, unfortunately. Ayana and Mandisa, thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Stay tuned. When we come back, celebrating the Day of the Dead. That's low. That's low. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. And finally from us tonight. Tradition combined with art recently when two Latino artists put up an installation in Sunset Park, Brooklyn to serve as an altar for the Mexican community's celebration of the Day of the Dead. A few dozen members of the community turn out for the event. We take in a few scenes from that night. Benjamin and I are both visual artists and we, we wanted to, to collaborate together on, on both of our styles and to create something that was going to be not only uh, representing something cultural but um, something artistic, something that people could kind of just come and, and appreciate the artwork and, and um, celebrate our ancestors. And this day is, is, a, is a day where um, Many, many people from all around the world, not just uh, Mexicanos or Latin Americans, uh, take a moment to meditate on people that they've lost and to honor those family members or friends for you know, what they've done for us to be here. Um, all the work and uh, all their sacrifice. It's a day to really celebrate those uh, dead ones and to um, enjoy their life as if they're still here with us, you know, which they are. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>